So let's move on to optical flow and depth estimation. We are getting closer and closer to real world applications and how you actually uh, design the components of a self-driving car or a robot. Optical flow is going to end up being useful when you have consecutive frames in a video and then you want to know this pixel in my image, which is, for instance, the right hand of a tennis player. This pixel on the right hand of a tennis player is going to be moving in your video. What is going to be its location in the next frame? And that's going to be an arrow between these two. So there is going to be a vector. This pixel is going to move from this location to the other location, from this frame to the next frame. And that's what you want to estimate. This is going to have applications when we go uh, and do action recognition in videos. What is that person doing? And this would be one of the features. In addition to your input image, you can input these optical flows, which are modeling the slight changes from one frame to the next frame. So they're modeling time. The other one, depth estimation, is uh, important for you to go beyond 2D images and start looking at the world in 3D. So the world around us is 3D and is always evolving, especially if you're a robot or if you're a self-driving car. You need to know how far the objects are from you in the, on the streets or in some indoor scene. And at the same time, you need to know uh, how things are evolving over time. Are they getting closer to you? What is changing? Okay, let's move on to flow estimation, flow net. And as I mentioned, for flow estimation, for optical flow, there is a pixel on the right hand of a tennis player. You're looking at the video from one frame to the next frame. That pixel is gonna change its location because it's a video, things are moving. And then you want to estimate those vectors per each point. Some of the points are not moving from one frame to the next frame. These are static, so there's gonna be a zero vector. Some of the points are moving fast and there's gonna be a huge vector corresponding to that pixel and some of the points are moving slower some of the pixels and that's what you want to do you have a data set it is consists of pairs of images from one frame to the next frame so somebody gives you a pair of images and then you want to come up with the flow from these pairs of images and that flow those vectors per each pixel so it's a per pixel prediction task is going to have a component in the x direction, it's going to have a component in the y direction. So it's a 2D object that you're predicting at each point. What is the data set? Unfortunately, for estimating flow and optical flows, there is no good measurement in the real world. So the sensors that we have are going to end up being too noisy and they are going to be too sparse. And to compensate for that lack of data, we can go ahead and work with simulated data. Flying chairs is one of those simulated data. You're just going to have different chairs put on different backgrounds, and you're simulating data. And then at the same time, because this is simulated data, you know the exact location of this chair from one frame to the next frame, and therefore you can write down your ground truth. You know how much did you move this particular pixel and in what direction. And this is actually a 2D output visualized nicely so that you can actually see it using a nice color pattern. For that, please refer to the appendix of the paper. So these are actually 2D objects that you're actually, or 2D arrows that you're plotting in a nice way with different colors. Okay, so far so good. This is the ground truth. These are two pairs of images and this is how your flow is gonna look like. So basically, if you take this image, change the pixels, pixel locations by this flow, you're gonna get very close to this other picture, other image. From one frame to the next frame, you can use this optical flow to take you. And then you can do data augmentation on that to expand your data. Different colors, different saturation, rotation, etc. And that's gonna give you different ground truth. So you're expanding the size of your data set using data augmentation. So flying chairs is a good data set to work with. The network architecture is going to take two images, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, stacked on top of each other as inputs. 
So now you have six channels rather than three channels. You push them through a bunch of convolutional layers. Sometimes you have some residual connections, copy and paste. There is this refinement uh, layer, which if you expand it, is a bunch of unpooling and convolutions. So let's take a look at it. The outcome of conv6 is going to come in. You're going to do one by one convolution. You put the output here. This is, the, this is your up convolution layer. There is this copy and paste from the layer before. There is another copy and paste from layer conv4, conv3, conv2, and you're concatenating. And then you're going to predict flow every once in a while. And these are going to end up being low resolution flows initially. And then finally, it's going to have a high resolution. You can have intermediate losses here because you know the ground truth. And then uh, not only that, you just copy that and paste it here. So this has this multi-stage nature. Look globally, decide locally type of architecture. There are some other data sets like Middlebury. But what are the catches here? The data set sizes are very small. Kitty is coming from some real sensors. For, for every frame that you have in your videos, you're gonna know the ground truth, but it's very sparse. 50% of the pixels in your image don't have any labels. Middleberry is very small. Sinto is a video. It's actually an animation. And because it is an animation, you know the ground truth of your flow map. And then flying chairs is what you just created. It has a reasonable size. What do you get out of it? An image goes in, this is the ground truth, this is what's coming out of FlowNet. You have another image. This is the ground truth. This is, this is what's coming out of FlowNet, how your flow is going to look like. In terms of the metric, you're going to be using endpoint error loss, which is just the Euclidean distance between the predicted flow vector, the ground truth flow vector, and you're averaging over all of your pixels. So it's nothing too fancy. And then you're getting really good results. Any questions about that? So the question is, how is the entire video processed through network pairwise? Yes, so the entire, vid the, the entire video, you're going to process it uh, pairwise. You take a slice of your video at this time, a slice of your video delta t uh, ahead of yourself, t plus delta t, and this is t. And then you're going to compute the flow. Does that answer your question? Yes, no. Yeah, so what you can do is you can pre-process your video, and then in the end, what your algorithm needs to be trained are a pair of input image and the ground truth. So you can either pre-process your videos or go through your videos one at a time. You can either do it online or offline, the pre-processing stage. Okay, perfect. What do you do when the ground truth flows are incomplete? You mean in this case? So that's a question that we saw an answer to when we were actually doing pose estimation. Sometimes for some particular pixels, you don't have any ground truth. So you just don't include them in your loss. But then what you're doing here is you are training your neural network on simulated data and then looking at how good it is going to transfer to the Kitty data set, which is for uh, self-driving cars. That's what you're doing. And at the same time, you can do some fine tuning and kitty as well. And if you decide to fine tune, whenever a pixel doesn't exist, you just don't include it in your loss function or you set the corresponding weight for it to be zero. Now, there is another question. How do we represent the flow vector in the predicted image? I think your question is about this color coding. Am I right? Yeah, for that, I need you to take a look at the paper. It has a color map. Whenever something has a zero, has, is, a, is actually white, there is no movement there. These are background. And then there is a color map that the further you go from the center of that color map, the color changes. And that one corresponds to the length of your vector. And then the direction is the angle. Let's say you're in polar coordinate. The, the angle is going to give you the direction. And the magnitude, you're going to have different magnitude for different vectors. And that color is changing uh, according to the angle and according to the length of your vectors. And that's how you can visualize a 2D uh, thing 
to the vector field using only one channel rather than multiple channels. So it has to do with the color coding. Does that answer your question? I think if you take a look at the paper, it's in the appendix, it's gonna be extremely clear. So I can leave that as an exercise. But these are actually 2D objects, 2D flows that you're plotting, the X coordinate and the Y coordinate of vectors.